and welcome to the third episode of the 2020 Travel Connect virtual series, What's Next for Business Travel? I'm your host, Peter Kane, the Director of Marketing Strategy, Content, and Brand at ARC, and today I am joined by a fantastic panel of travel professionals who I will introduce now. Uh, Suzanne Boyan is the Meetings and Travel Manager for ZS Associates. Lance Little is the Managing Director of Aviation for Seattle Tacoma International Airport. And we also have Michael Partridge, the uh, VP of Sales and Revenue Analysis for Marriott International. Welcome to everyone. Before we get into the conversation, I just have a few quick housekeeping notes. If you run into any technical challenges or have um, any logistical questions, we offer the chat feature uh, and our team will gladly assist you. Um, any questions you have uh, for the Q&A portion of our program, please use the Q&A window. If you would like to change up your display, there's actually a little um, uh, icon at the top right of your main uh, window where you can move from a video strip view to a side-by-side -side view to a floating panel view. Lastly, we really encourage you to engage with us on your favorite social channels with the hashtag TravelConnect2020. While ARC does not have TikTok, we can be found on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. With that, let's get going. COVID-19 has changed the business travel experience. While corporate travel continues to lag the leisure market, travel managers, TMCs, suppliers, and other organizations throughout the supply chain and traveler journey are examining how to best support the business traveler, including how to set traveler expectations, provide adequate duty of care, and ensure comprehensive support in this rapidly changing environment. To begin, I'm going to ask our panelists just to introduce themselves a little bit and give a brief overview of what the past several months have been like for each of them. And I'm going to do this in alphabetical order by last name because that's just the way I decided to do this. So I'm going to start with Suzanne. Um, so, yeah, uh, again, I'm Suzanne Boyan. I'm the Meetings and Travel Manager at CS Associates. And, wow, the past few months have been Somehow, even though there is no travel taking place at CS, they've been crazier than ever. Um, just we're still allowing people to transfer our, from office to office. Um, and then, of course, we had many people who, when the pandemic started, decided to go home to their families and now are trying to get back to their home offices. So we do have a little bit of travel in the air, certainly nowhere near our usual numbers. So communicating with them and, and helping them understand what should be expected of them from, from point A to point B, the entire journey, is like getting into a cab even now looks different, right, than, than it did before the pandemic started. What's the airport journey going to feel like? What are the airlines requiring of, of, our, of our people? And then even entering into different countries. Um, as a quick example, we had somebody go into uh, Canada and they have to, you know, declare how they're going to get food for 14 days, how they're going to get medical support for 14 days. Um, so having to think through all of that with our fellow team members and legal and HR, um, it's, it's been an unusual and a fun learning experience. I can definitely relate to it feeling more busy than ever, <laughs> despite <Yes>. less trouble. <laughs> um, Lance, I'll turn to you. Um, just interested to hear how things have been going for you and uh, for SEA. Um, so just like Susan said, it's ironic that it's been the um, period of time that we've seen the least amount of passengers. We have not seen passenger traffic this low since 1967. But just like Susan said, we have never, ever been busier. And that's, that's the irony in this in this hour. Um, the, the pandemic has caused a downturn that um, is actually worse than 9-11 and the Great Recession uh, combined. Uh, we really didn't understand how significant uh, the impact um, was, and we're still um, uh, assessing the situation. Just um, if you look at the aviation industry and our airport in particular, we have been on this growth the last 10 years, record growth. And then all of a sudden, March of this year, everything changed. And April, it was at its worst. We're down 9 to 5 percent in terms of traffic relative to the year um, before. And you could literally roll a bowling ball through the airport in April and you wouldn't hit, um, you wouldn't hit anyone at all. Uh, the good thing is, is that the traffic is steadily growing um, since um, April. In fact, the traffic now is about almost 10 times what it was 
um, in April, just to kind of put it in perspective. However, we're talking about in April, we're at maybe 2,500 passengers coming through the checkpoint. We're more like 18,000, 19,000 coming through the checkpoint these days. However, to put that in perspective, if you compare it to last year, um, at this time, we're at 50, 60,000 um, passengers. So it's been devastating, not just for the airlines and the airport, but for all the tenants and all the businesses that operate at the airport, whether you're a taxi, a limousine, concessionaires, um, you know, rent a car companies, every company at the airport has been impacted significantly by this downturn. The good thing is that it's been trended up and we hope it continues that way. We're observing what's happening in some of the other states, such as California, Alabama, um, Florida, and we're hoping that we continue to have that V shape or Nike switch shape recovery and not have a W shape recovery. If we enter into another downturn, then it's going to be serious consequences for the airports and all the tenants um, that depend on this airport for survival. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And Michael, let's hear what's going on at Marriott. Sure, yeah, my name's uh, Mike Partridge. I've been the uh, Vice President of Sales and Revenue Management Marriott now for about five years and been in the travel industry for 20 years. And uh, like everyone else, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, and as a, uh, as a global hospitality company, it was, it was interesting to watch how we went into the downturn globally. You know, first it was China, then it was other parts of Asia, then it was Europe. We could see it make its way to the U.S., right? And then we've also been able to watch the progress of recovery play out globally as well. Again, first in China, then really in the U.S., and now we're starting to see signs of improvement in Europe and a little bit in the Middle East. What's interesting, too, is where we've had setbacks in Beijing uh, and then, of course, recently in the U.S., especially in the Southeast and the Southwest, we saw how business uh, fell back from that setback and then begin to recover from it. So we're starting to get kind of a pattern of what that's going to look like. Uh, and, you know, looking ahead, you know, there, there are going to be more setbacks, you know, around the world. And the, the question is, how do we, how do we come back from those and, and how do travelers really come back? Yeah, it's a really interesting environment. And, you know, you've, all three of you kind of touched on how just fractured everything is. Um, and, you know, Suzanne, I'd like to kind of come back to you and talk about that a little bit and how, as a travel manager, you know, how are you going about even getting that information about, you know, where a traveler is going, where they're coming back from, getting it to the traveler? Like, it, it seems like a daunting task. <laughs> it is. Um, thankfully, I have a lot of trust in, in my suppliers. Um, so, you know, the, it is fragmented. So we, we have an open program. So we have to pull data from Traxo for our direct booking strategy and then also from our TMC partner, Lux. Um, and, and then together, we're, by looking at both data sets, I'm able to have a pretty comprehensive feel for where my travelers are on a global spectrum. And then in terms of what they're, where they're going and what would be expected of them, uh, we rely on so many different resources, the CDC, WHO, um, local government organizations from all over the world, because we're also a global program. Um, and then just trying to consolidate the information into a user-friendly package, really, for our travelers. Yeah, it's, um, I know that just even as a traveler myself who, like, was regularly on the road, I, I haven't flown since March. I don't think I've left the state of Colorado since March. And I'm thinking, like, I don't even know what to expect, like, when I get to the airport at this point. And so, Lance, I'm interested to hear from you, like, what, what has SBA done to kind of help guide the travelers, whether that's before the journey or while they're at the airport or even in transition between, you know, on a, on a connection. So we have started by um, communicating with our passengers prior to them coming to the airport. So we have information that we have on our website. We have blogs um, that we put out. We have um, uh, releases that we that we put out on a monthly um, basis. We have social media um, posts. Uh, that we have. So we have communicated, I think, effectively with our, our passengers. So we try to get the information to them before they actually um, come to the airport. Once you get to the airport, you'll see signs. Up. We have more than 5,000 signs um, at the airport right now. You'll see F Florida calls, which um, basically is um, enhancing our helping people to social um, distance at the airport. We have what we call squeeze guards or plexiglass um, that kind of separates um, contact between 
uh, airlines um, uh, um, attendants and passengers coming uh, to to the airport. Um, you know, we we have a, a mask requirement here at the airport. So you know, if you're in the airport, you're required to wear a mask unless there is a medical reason why you cannot uh, wear a mask. So we have done. We don't think there's any silver bullet uh, per se, and that's one of the reasons why we have. Um, you know, we have a multi-layer approach. And this airport has never, it has been clean before, but I'm telling you, it has never been cleaner than it is. You know, the, if you look at our security checkpoint, you'll see that our um, janitorial team members, they're cleaning the checkpoint on an hourly basis. So there, there are so many things. We have more than 250 hand sanitizers distributed uh, throughout the airport. And we have our app. You can use our app to actually find those hand sanitizers if you, if you need to. So it, you know it, it, it's a totally different um, experience than than um, you'd see uh, before. It's challenging in terms of we need more space to accommodate less people because of social um, distancing, and we have to do that on the buses that take people, for example, from the rent a car from the parking facilities, and on our trains in the airport system, we have to make sure we maintain social distancing on the train and etc. So it's a, it's a really um, different experience, but we're doing everything in our part to ensure that the journey through the airport is a safe and healthy one. That's great, that's great. And Michael, you're in even a, a kind of a, another situation where Marriott has, um, you know, there are properties around the world and in many instances, they're owned and operated by, by other, like by organizations, right? And so you have these partners you need to work with. So how, how are you navigating that, particularly given that the pandemic is so different in so many different parts of the world, even in the United States itself? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a huge challenge, and you know there there are things that we can do as the Marriott organization directly, right? So you know we control the website, we we control the uh, the Bonvoy member connection point, you know, to our loyalty members, and you know, we can reach out to them via emails, and we can post information online to make sure the guests you know understand what's going on. In terms of what actually happens at the hotel, you're right. We have a little less direct control, but We've had great partnerships with our franchise management community uh, and, you know, work, really work with them on standards for cleaning the room, our commitment to clean, as well as standards for how we interact with the guests at the front desk uh, and, and, and in terms of, uh, you know, mandating masks. And, uh, you know, it's difficult because, you know, typically the, the, the strongest kind of hospitality connection we can make is, is at that front desk where uh, you have a, uh, you know, you have a human talking to a human, and you know now we have to do so much of that, you know, through the website and and uh, and a little bit more remotely. But you know, it's a challenge that we're that we're taking up. But again, we have long-term relationships with these hospitality com hospitality management companies, the franchisees, uh, and so I, I feel like we're making it work. Yeah, you hit a really good point, and I think it's why we're all in this industry, right? Is for that human connection. We 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 love discovery. We love connecting. And it's something that I think has really been lost and will be lost for some time as a result of this. So I think it's kind of on all of us to figure out how can we create that connection despite associated with it. So um, I, I, do not, I do not envy that. <laughs> I do not envy you guys. Um, Suzanne, with a global program like yours and going back to kind of the different, you know, Southeast Asia is in a very different place from Southeast United States, right? Um, are you able to leverage some of the learnings in these different markets to apply them to travel in, 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 in other markets? Yeah, so we, we've, we were hoping to be able to do that. And I think this is probably going to be uh, sounding familiar to, to any other corporate travel manager. We've actually given, given our employees the choice on whether or not they're comfortable to get back out on the road. Many have said not yet. Um, also, our, our travel is very dependent on our clients wanting us next to them. And right now our clients have basically said, not yet, <laughs> um, please, please don't come. Um, so even though Southeast Asia is in a different place than we are, um, our clients, I think, are still trying to wrap their arms around their own travel before they welcome us back in. Um, so I think we'll probably be one of the last sectors to, to sadly get back out on the road. I know I have many road warriors who are excited for it. Uh, I know I'm excited for it, um, but, but we'll get there. And, and so, unfortunately, I don't have any lessons learned quite yet. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I know, it's amazing to think that it's only really been 
I was six months. Yeah. <laughs> it feels a lot longer than that. Um, it sure does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lance, um, you mentioned something interesting previously about how you have to navigate not just like the airport inside the airport itself, right? And that's, I think, what a lot of travelers say about they get to the airport, they go to the, the front of their check in desk, they go through security, they get to the gate, they get on the airplane. But there's so much more involved, right? Like from the car to um, your concession partners. Um, how are you working with all of them? And and what you know, I know I know SCA had done a lot of upgrades previously to to the uh, pandemic. And like, how has that work kind of helped you through this? Yeah. So what what we're looking at is um, what would it take for us to have a touchless journey um, coming through the airport itself? And we are the airport operators. Airports are like miniature cities, right? So there there are many different companies that operate within this airport, and so there are very various different touch points. So we're looking at the journey from someone driving up to the curb or someone getting to the garage, getting into the airport, etc., getting on an airplane. How can we make that journey touchless? And so we have to collaborate with all of our airport partners. So we have taxi drivers, we have TNC such as Uber, Lyft, um, and Wings that operate at the airport. We have shuttle bus drivers. Uh, we have our rental car um, companies here, we have our concessionaires. All of them has to be a part of this um, entire touchless journey. So, they, for example, one of the things that we might take for granted in, in the past that we're looking at, how can we make that experience touchless? Is when you come to the airport, chances are you have to go in some elevator. Um, somewhere. And, um, you know, how can we make the elevator touch this? So we're looking at various different technology, whether it's audio um, technology, where you can just speak to get to your floor or find some other way that you don't have to use your fingers um, to, to push buttons. Once you get into the airport, how can you order your food, for example, without having to touch anything? So we have QR codes, that, for example, with the menus where you can just load the menus on your phone and you can order without having to, to touch physically um, touch a, a menu. So um, even though we don't know exactly what's going to happen on the road, we know that touchless technology is going to be a key component of the next norm. And so we're investing heavily in touchless technology. But of course, we can't do it by ourselves. We need our partners. We need the rental car companies. We need the concessionaires. We need the airlines, um, of course, to partner with us. And we need our external entities such as CDC, um, the TSA, and the and the um, uh, CD, CDP, Customs and Border Protection, to all collaborate with us to make this journey touchless and help to come to the airport, in and out of the airport. Yeah, it's it really is like a, it's a joint effort. And as you said, it's, an airport is like a little city and it just, you have so many different pieces going on that, um, that, that collaboration is critical. Um, and I really, I like the um, kind of transition here because you start talking about some like new technology implementation and that's something that I've seen so far throughout this pandemic within this industry is how, you know, whether it's rewriting how we do settlement here at ARC or it's leveraging new technology in order to um, create a customer experience that feels more comfortable. Um, and like, I want to kind of go back to Suzanne now because she's done so much, in my opinion, to to kind of be a vanguard of like new technology adoption within the managed travel space and creating this like real omni-channel program and I'm just I'm curious how that investment that you've made in that design has helped you through this. I think if we were to back up just to, before I answer the direct question is is there value in in having an omnichannel program? And and the answer is to me, yes, right? And admittedly I'm very biased. <laughs> um, but I think there's always going to be a good excuse for someone to book outside of your program, whether that's for a conference, whether that's for um, you know, utilizing a client rate, whatever that might be. And and to be clear, my travelers come up with all of the good excuses. I'm not the one to come up with the good excuses, right? And so what was helpful during the pandemic of having the omnichannel program was I knew really without a shadow of a doubt where my travelers were because we didn't have this massive blind spot um, because people may have been at a conference and and because of the technology that we've engaged with Traxo, um, we were able to pull that data in and and I will say um, that a big part of that is is due to our, our BI tool that, that's a bit homegrown, um, but essentially it pulls in all of the data pieces so that way I don't have to work too hard because 
it's, it's easy enough when only seven travelers are going at it <laughs> during a pandemic uh, to pull two uh, spreadsheets together. But when you're, we're talking about 12,000 people up in the air, um, that's not something I want to do manually, and nor is it something I want my team to do manually. So having that tool be able to quickly identify this person booked outside of your program, we got it from the card data, or this person booked way outside of your program and we didn't know until they submitted an expense, that allows us to have a different conversation with our travelers. Yeah, it's just a, it allows you to, that transparency into what's truly happening out there, which, you know, when it comes to media care is so important. <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> especially when countries start closing borders and people have to get home. <laughs> and yeah. you have 72 hours to figure out how to get them there and where they are. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I still think there's going to be value in allowing your travelers to make good choices, uh, not just on behalf of whatever they're doing, but on behalf of your company, right? Um, and, and for me, it's just all about getting the data. Once you have the data, you can, you can do a lot with it. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and that's a fantastic transition. You guys are doing really great here. This is a great transition to my question, Michael, because I was, when we were talking kind of in our prep session, you know, we were talking a little bit about the data that you're seeing, and, and I'm just curious to, for the audience to hear kind of what, like, trends are you seeing that might not necessarily be unexpected given the middle of a pandemic, but are, I think, interesting nonetheless. Sure. So when we have been looking at, at business in the U.S., and, you know, obviously, you know, the numbers are a fraction of what they were last year, right? But we've kind of come up off the floor of where we were back in uh, March and April. And uh, we're starting to see some some stronger uh, performance, and it's it's you know it's probably no surprise, right? It's 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 less in the big downtown hotels, it's more in the in the suburban hotels. In the heart of the summer, we got better performance at our resorts. In general, it's it's leisure business. Uh, the group business, the big association business, big corporate events, those are those are all gone, and they're off the books really through the end of the year. Uh, but what we are seeing is a lot of short-term bookings. Uh, the booking window is really compressed, right? And, you know, part of that is that, you know, a lot of, you know, really short-term spontaneous uh, trips that you have to make, you know, you had to make them then and you have to make them now. And the other part is that trips that you would have planned longer for, hey, now, you, you know, you're waiting to get the latest health information. Uh, you know the hotel's got occupancy, so there's not a lot, a lot of risk there. Um, so we've seen that window uh, kind of shorten. And we've also seen a big change in uh, drive market versus flight markets. And you know, if I if I look at our um, at our loyalty information to get kind of a sense of how how far are people traveling uh, to go to the to go to the hotels. Uh, it's generally 300 miles or less. So they're, they're driving, they're not flying. Yeah, I, I have a hypothesis and I don't necessarily know if I'll be, ever be able to figure it out, but it comes down to like, right, I live in Denver and there's a list of a thousand things that I want to see in Colorado that previously I probably wouldn't have gotten to, but now like I'm probably going to try to get to them because it's within that driving distance for me, right? And yeah, the, the Fairfield Inn in front of uh, Glacier National Park's been running really strong occupancy. That's what I was trying to get to. I'm, that's <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, and I'm just I'm I'm fascinated to see how that continues to play out. Just because I'm nerdy like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lance, at the beginning you were mentioning the the you know hopefully we see this more Nike swoosh re recovery versus any sort of W-shaped recovery. And you sit on the um, Government Affairs Committee for the, make sure I get this right here, for the American Association of Airport Executives. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear, um, you know, kind of what that process was like to secure the funding for airports and like what that group continues to do um, as part of its um, advocacy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was that was a very interesting um, endeavor <laughs> um, that we embarked on. In fact, I, I recall that prior to traveling a whole lot last week, uh, my last travel was actually going to D.C., going to the White House to meet with the vice president um, staff to advocate and lobby for $10 billion for the aviation um, industry. Because one of the things we realized was, you know, we had a, we had a three prong approach where one, we had to weather the storm, and two, we needed to lead the recovery, and then we needed to prepare for the next storm. 
in order to weather the storm, we needed we need to have cash. We needed money, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we advocated. We had, at that time we had estimated that the industry, aviation wide, um, we were going to be down about ten billion dollars, and and so we advocated for ten billion dollars to be included in the CARES Act. It was not included in the initial the two drafts that were initially done, and we saw that as a major concern for us. And so we lobbied very hard, not just my not just myself, but all the other major airports, as well as um, the AAAE, as you mentioned, ACI, Airport Council International, AMAP, Airport Minority Advisor Council. And we got a lot of support from our congressional um, delegation. It would not be support um, successful without the support. And so we actually got uh, $10 billion um, for all airports included, and the airlines got about $60 billion as well. Our airport got $192 million um, allocated to us. Now we have revised uh, the impact of the airports um, in nationwide, and we're now recalculating. It's not a ten billion dollar impact; it's more like a twenty-three billion dollar impact. So for the next CARES Act or HEALS or whatever we're going to end up calling it, we're actually trying to get thirteen billion dollars for airports included in that, and about five point five or three billion dollars included for concession years um, at the airport. So we were successful. Not so sure how successful we're going to be. Um, with the next act, but we're we're fighting very hard. Without the CARES Act money, that that ten billion dollars and the one ninety two million that we got, we would not be able to provide the relief that we have done for concessionaires, for the rent a car companies, the taxi operators, for all the tenants at the airport. We would just not be able to have the, to do that. Yeah, and that's a really good point when you think about like the downstream impact of 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 this, right? It's not again, it's not just the airport. It's all the jobs associated with the concessionaires, the restaurants, um, you know, et cetera, right? right? But, you know, the airport has a, a $22.5 billion um, impact in the region through direct, indirect, and induced activities. 156,000 jobs are associated with the airport. And so if when we're on a decline, it's a major impact for the region. Suzanne, I'm wondering from your perspective, like, you know, as we continue to see, you know, some modest recovery here in the U.S. Um, you know, what do you see kind of as that medium term for business travel? Like, the short term is it, there's not a lot, right? The medium term is like what there's going to be this hybrid environment that we live in before, you, you know, there's a treatment or a vaccine. That treatment and vaccine get distributed. Um, it's going to take a long time. So, I mean, how are you kind of planning for that? I think everyone is hoping that the vaccine is going to just, and then it's going to boom, right? It's going to cure whatever ailment is happening in travel. And, and the bottom line is, I still think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be hesitant to take it. Um, and that's, I'm not saying that they should be or shouldn't be. I'm not a scientist. Um, but, you know, just we have this battle every year with the flu. And there are people who don't want to take that shot, right? Um, and and then you have this this other um, sense of, well, there are some businesses that are actually doing okay during this pandemic and knock on wood, the S has been one of them. So maybe travel does look a little bit different for us in the future. And, and I think that's what, what people are really grappling with now. Uh, so for us, we, you know, I happen to think that or hope because I, I love this industry so much that things will will start to look a little bit more like a medium to your point in 2021. I think it will probably last for a couple of years um, and then and then really full steam ahead, probably not till 2023. Um, that that's not a, a ZS point of view. I want to be clear. I think that's just a that's just my sense of all industries and how they're attacking it. Yeah, and so you're going to have to really a tough challenge because you're going to have to manage travelers through this weird environment where, you know, it's flat some places, there's spikes other places. And so like what would you look for from your suppliers and your other partners, you know, whether that's Lux or whether that's um, you know, your air hotel or rental car partners? I think I think from from our TMC, what we would want is is a, a partnership in in ensuring that we have the data that we need to run a successful program. Um, anything they can do to help service 
our travelers who are booking direct, I think is, first of all, they're, they're ready to do that. <laughs> we just need to actually book. Um, I think that that's, that's truly what's going to be helpful because, you know, I'm not sure anyone has a good answer for this. And to be clear, there's no playbook for it. This is the first time it's happened since, <laughs> you know, aviation's been around. <laughs> um, that we, we, we come up with a game plan. What if someone gets sick on the road? I, you know, I don't have a good answer for that right now. Um, and, and that's something that I would want to lean on, on my TMC partner and also my suppliers with. Right now, the information I need, and what I've found very helpful um, is the airlines and, and I'm waiting for the hotels, so no, no pressure, Michael, um, is they've offered tours um, of properties so that we can, or well, they've offered tours of airports so we can see what, what, what is being done. And that was, I think, really eye-opening to me to see how different airports feel now. Um, and to have a better sense of what my travelers who have to be on the road are going through. And, and so the one blind spot I have is truly hotels. Um, but that's, that's not to say they're not doing a fantastic job. That's just to say, I don't, I can't vouch personally <laughs> on the behalf of, of what they're doing. Yeah. And Michael, kind of to that end, like, um, you know, there, I think there's a lot that the hotels are doing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of cleanliness of the rooms and how we how we treat the guests when they come in, you know, we you know we're working on um, uh, you know how can we do a check in session that doesn't involve the front desk at all? You know, can you use your phone as a key? Can we do a, a, a reservation in advance so that you just you know pick up a sterilized key at the front desk and don't have to talk to anybody? And we can do some of those things through our uh, you know especially for our, uh, our our loyalty members and through the app and through our website. So we're definitely working on that. And, uh, you know, it's such a challenge because in normal times, the shared space of the hotel is really the asset, right? The, the luxurious nature of the, of the lobby, the hotel bar, all those sorts of things. And, and now, you know, it's reversed. You know, those are the places that, that people shun. And so it's, it's tricky to, you know, be able to communicate to our customers that, you know, hey, even while you don't have all of these facilities, we can still, you know, more or less guarantee you a clean room and a safe environment. And that's that's something we really want to try and make sure we can communicate. Uh, and, and Suzanne, I'm sorry if we haven't been able to do that with you very well, but I, I know our hotels are, are, are working very hard. And it, it is an interesting way of thinking about your hotel, like, as that safe space, right? Like, you know, if I have to travel... You know, I've been I've been holed up in my castle here at home, <laughs> right? But if I have to travel, you know, kind of my new castle is going to be my hotel room, and I think that's going to be the case for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I hope so. And we, you know, you know, we've we've seen that in a bit in in um, especially some of our extended stay hotels where where uh, extended stays have been extended even a little bit longer. Uh, you know, where people are able to, you know, use a hotel room that, that, you know, has a, has a kitchenette and, you know, has an extra room, uh, you know, those, those things are valuable, but, uh, you know, ultimately it's, it's getting people, you know, wanting to travel again and feel, feeling safe traveling again. And, you know, again, we get different kinds of customers, but until we get everybody feeling safe, we're not going to get all of them back. Yeah, exactly. And Lance, we talked a little bit about that too. Um, you know, when we chatted a couple of weeks ago, the importance of just in helping people to feel confident and safe in their journey. And I know that Seattle uh, or SEA is an example of an airport that's done um, done tours, correct? Yeah. So uh, you know, we, we we started the Fly Healthy at SEA initiative, and the objective of that initiative was to restore traveler confidence. Um, you know, if we don't have passengers coming back to the airport, all the businesses at the airport literally dies, um, whether it's the airline, the concession, it's everybody. And so we, we know it's very important to restore um, traveler confidence, but also not just travelers, but also the people who work at the airport or employees, the people who do businesses at the airport, we have to ensure that they feel safe and secure. And, uh, you know, it, it, the airports are uh, a network. Right, it, it, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So it has to happen at all airports, nationwide or worldwide. And to just extend it, just to follow up on what Michael says, 
in terms of the entire journey it has to happen at hotels. As I'm right now, I'm at a hotel right now, and it, it, I'm very, um, it, 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 it's, it, it was a relief for me to see how the hotel is operating because it functioned just like the airport. There's decals everywhere, have to wear a mask. I'm in my castle, as you say, I'm in the, the hotel room, and you know they they won't no one will come to clean the room unless I ask them to, and so I'm you know I feel safe I'm isolated here at the airport and so I'm thinking the airports the hotels the entire journey you really have to um, feel safe so if you again if you come to the airport all the stuff that I mentioned the 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 signage the plexiglass which I see here at the hotel as well um, everything is there to restore traveler confidence we have to get um, passengers traveling again that's the lifeblood. Of the, of the industry. And the, one of the ironic thing that we saw um, with 9-11 in the Great Recession was that the recovery was actually led by business travelers. Ironically, this time, the recovery is actually being led by leisure travelers. Most of the business travelers are actually doing what we're doing right now. And so business travelers are lagging a little bit behind. We anticipate it might be six months behind. We don't know. But the ironic thing is that leisure travelers are the one that's leading the, and I'm not sure if it's just because of timing, it's summer, et cetera, but we see leisure travelers actually leading the recovery right now. Some other interesting trend, just, just real quick, is that um, we saw an uptick in rent-a-car usage, right? People are opting for rent-a-car versus taxis and, and, and Uber and Lyft because I think they feel safer just being in that space. So there's some interesting things that's happening in the industry right now. Yeah, it, there's a... Um... For anybody interested on, on online, uh, if you go onto the ARC website, we actually have our week over week or week by week trends uh, that breaks out the various um, travel agency um, business models. And uh, yes, definitely right now, um, our OTA space and leisure agencies are, are uh, doing very better than our uh, TMCs at this point. Um, but for Sue, Suzanne, I'm, you know, I think I, I don't know if I touched on this earlier today or if it was in what we just, you know, we had our conversation prior to the part of the event, but business travel in a, lar in a large sense has been on autopilot for so many years, right? Um, I knew exactly what flight I was taking from Denver to Dulles. I knew exactly which Marriott property I was going to go stay at. Um, if, if I could stay at another one down the street, right? I knew even which restaurant I was going to eat like every night, right? And that's probably isn't going to be the case going forward. So I'm just, I'm curious, like are, how are your, have your travelers expressed any of that to you or <laughs> what are you hearing from them? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, we have, I think my favorite example is we have one traveler who, who goes from Chicago to Boston three times a week and he just, he knows exactly what flight he's taking on United. He knows exactly what property he's staying at to your point. And now a lot of those options aren't even available because we're, you know, we just, we can't put every single plane up in the air. Um, it would it would financially crush the airlines, right? Um, and and so now people are having to think a lot more about it. Like, oh, well, okay, my first choice isn't available. Even my second choice isn't available. How do I? How, what does my travel look like now? And and for our travelers in particular, um, you know, when they're when they're traveling and they're away from their families, it's, it's tough, right? Because now a couple of extra hours can easily turn into a few hours or even more away from their families. And we, we demand a lot of them. We don't do 40 hour work weeks in consulting, uh, 50 to 60 is the norm. Um, and, and so, you know, the one thing they always loved was being able to get home um, whenever they wanted. And, and that, that's going to look a little different in the near term. Yeah. So, it be, and it becomes a real, um, like a talent challenge, um, you know, in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, how people feel, you know, how they feel about the job, you know, and retaining talent is, I'm curious, I feel like that's going to get a little tougher. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because the one it, people always say when you go from consulting firm to consulting firm, what are the differentiators? I mean, the work is, is roughly the same, more or less, right? Um, but and the the hours are the same, more or less, <laughs> not great. And and so it's the travel program turns into either this asset or or worse, right? And now all of us are are having the same challenge. So I, I do think it's gonna. You know, again, we're going to work with our partners as closely as possible to to help sh 
if we communicate clearly what we need, hopefully they will be able to deliver um, because the, the demand will be there. Um, not quite yet, but soon, we hope. Yeah, for sure. And kind of pivoting off of the talent conversation, um, Michael, I know that like Mary, Marriott, like that employee, you know, it's really important for the employee to have a great experience. And so um, kind of also building off of what Lance said about ensuring the safety of the folks that are working, um, I know that's something that Marriott's taken very seriously. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, we're all hospitality professionals. People didn't get into this industry just, you know, just, just for the money. These are, these are people, uh, people, people. And they, they want to connect, right? And when you're traveling, you, you kind of want that too. And it's uh, it's difficult that now we're in the situation where you know you you've got to be a little bit more uh, restrained. But um, you know I do feel that there's a lot of reasons why there's a real pent up demand that I think is going to open up, right? And you know part of it is you know we're all getting better at you know having remote calls, right? We're on a WebEx meeting right now. It's, it's going pretty well. But it's not quite the same as being there together in sidebars and you don't know where you can interject. Uh, I think, you know, this, as more people get experience using these, they begin to, to feel the limitations and, and people ultimately, you know, are, are going to want to get together. And the other thing I'd, I'd add in is, you know, for frequent travelers, you know, your loyalty points and the miles that you earn for, for flights and for rent-a-cars, that's really part of your compensation especially for people who are on the road a lot, right? And they're, you know, they're not, they're not getting that. Now. They, these are people who like to travel both for business and for leisure, and they're, they're not getting that, uh, those, those points accrual. So it's, that's another reason why I'm optimistic that we'll see business travelers, you know, come back as, as they can. And we, we're seeing that a little bit in the numbers, uh, a little bit more in China, that's kind of a, ahead of the U.S. in the recovery spectrum. So, you know, hopefully those trends will continue to build, but it's certainly behind leisure, but it's not, it's not zero. No, it's definitely not zero. And I'm, I, I, I fully agree with you. There is this demand. I, when I was doing the video um, with Jay Bamer from the beat last month, um, all we kept saying was, man, I wish we could be doing this on a stage someplace. Right. Um, and true to your point as well, I have a lot of Marriott points that are burning a hole in my pocket right now that I really just want to use. Um, so I, I, I do agree. I think there's some definite pent up demand in there. And also I think as, you know, the, the population, the, Matt, I'll say the population um, becomes more comfortable with navigating in a socially distanced way, wearing masks, you know, I don't necessarily think that people are just going to stay cooped up forever, so long as they're able to go someplace and go someplace safely and feel safe while they're doing it. Um, so I'm curious to see kind of how, as we get used to this, what you know, what we'll call now normal, um, how behavior might change as a result, and hopefully for the positive, uh, at least for all of us. <laughs> so we're at um, about 15 minutes left. Um, I figure I'll take a look at the uh, the Q and A's here. Um, and uh, for folks on the line, if you have additional questions, please, please submit them. We will try to get to um, as many as we possibly can. <laughs> so to start off, I'm just, I'm going to stay with you, Michael. Um, there's a question about the current and forward bookings in hotel, um, kind of based on the high end luxury brands versus your budget and mid tier brands. And if there's any difference in sort of those, those spaces, um, if that's something you can can even share for the booking windows. Uh, I mean, in, in normal times, they're obviously longer for the higher end uh, properties than they are for the select properties. Although, you know, a lot of it depends on just how, how busy that market is, right? The, the courtyards in New York city fill up a long time in advance. Uh, today that all the booking windows for all of those have become much, much shorter. Uh, there are, you know, a few exceptions here or there. Uh, especially resort uh, properties uh, and and um, properties that are near, uh, uh, you know, like national parks or things like that. Um, but otherwise, no, it's it's surprisingly uniform in how short the booking window has fallen, become. Yeah, and from a forward booking perspective, um, you know, you, you mentioned that the Fairfield Inn at Glacier is doing great. Yeah, they've got better um, occupancy than they had last year. <laughs> Uh, so is that kind of a consistent trend where, you know, 
maybe the, I mean, obviously you said like the downtown high end hotels um, might be seeing a little bit less volume than sort of your mid tier kind of budget level brands that are in some places like Glacier. Yeah, the, the select properties are doing a little bit better, but if you, if you peel the onion on that a little bit and, and um, you know, look at high end resorts that, that aren't in downtown areas, but that maybe are, are, uh, are golf resorts or more kind of suburban areas, they, those are doing a little bit better, uh, more akin to this, the select property. So there's, there's demand at different price points, uh, but it's all very safety conscious. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Lance, for you, um, there's been chatter in the news about rapid testing. And I know, um, particularly as schools start opening up again, um, the need to be able to take a test and have results, you know, pretty much, you know, not immediately, but near immediate. Is that something that the airports are looking at in terms of, um, you know, opportunity to help increase uh, comfort and feeling safe and also, you know, obviously decrease? Um, chance of spread. Oh yeah, we're definitely looking at that. We actually just completed a temperature check, um, proof of concept or pilot as some people may call it. We did it for international arriving passengers. We also did it for domestic outgoing um, passengers as well. But of course, that's, that has its limitation. And we think the, I guess the ultimate solution would be a rapid um, test. So we're working with uh, a group and um, Vancouver Airport they're looking at that as well. And we're looking at what um, layout and infrastructure would we need to have in place um, should we get to that point. I mean, I did a, I did a test uh, just before I traveled. I actually got myself tested at 12.30. I got my results maybe 10.30 in the night, but that's not fast enough. If you're traveling, you really need to get it maybe within a few minutes if you're gonna be at the airport. So that, that will probably be the, 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 um, the, the ultimate solution apart from the vaccine. But it has to be done, uh, as I said, the airports, there is a network. So if one airport is doing it and another airport is not doing it, it really doesn't make sense. You'd have to have it being done at multiple airports. So we're definitely monitoring to see how fast rapid testing um, will be available and the minutes it's available. Um, we, we intend to look seriously at having it at SeaTac Airport. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting, and yeah, I, there's so many. Um, I think Suzanne, you said it. Like this is there's so many different pieces. There's not a silver bullet, and it's our ability um, as an industry and as a society to be able to implement all of them in order to kind of get over this thing. Um, a question um, for um, for everybody, I guess, is what do you think? Um, that travel brands can do across the value chain to help move the recovery forward. Um, you know, our, our, our travel agencies are particularly, you know, they've been hit very, very hard. And I know that folks are just trying to find ways to help encourage travel, right? And there's obviously policy implications to that, but also just in general, kind of some of the stuff that we've been talking about here. Yeah, I think it, it starts just with a commitment to, to safety and cleanliness. Right, and you know, from the hotel's perspective, that's the that's the front desk experience, it's the check-in experience, it's the it's the clean room when you get there, and it's the it's how how you're treated during the course of your stay. And uh, I think, as, as Lance was saying, especially, it's it's got it, it can't just be the hotels, right? They have to have that same level of comfort in the airports, on the planes, getting the rental car or the shuttle or however they're getting to the hotel. And then when they leave the hotel, when they go to a restaurant or when they go somewhere else, if, if people don't feel safe at any step along that journey, then they don't feel safe on the journey. Um, if I could jump in just to add to what Michael just said, um, consistency and standards. Um, just to, to, to piggyback on what Michael said, I've been to multiple airports in the last week. I've been to multiple restaurants, hotels. And there are some hotels and airports that you feel safer than some, just because of, um, you know, they have sanitizers everywhere, social distancing, and everybody's in a mask, et cetera. And there are some restaurants that, hmm, not so much. And then there are some that you give a, a thumbs up. So I think consistency and standards across, whether it's a hotel, whether it's at the airport, whether it's in the restaurant, um, you really have to have those standards. So you feel safe at every step of the journey, as, as Micah said, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, and Suzanne, I think you mentioned it at the beginning, like 
question around like how do I, you know in Canada do you have the ability to get food for 14 weeks right to quarantine um, it just it seems like again it's so fractured and with just that consist finding that consistency across you know, right whether it's state line or that yeah I think that's going to be a real challenge it, too. It, I mean it's going to be impossible right I, I mean asking United to work hand in hand with American to work hand in hand with Delta to come up with a solid standard that we can all agree on, I think is, I mean, that would be wonderful. I would have loved that pre pandemic <laughs> that we can all agree on some great standards. I just, you know, I, I think we just have to be realistic that we, we weren't there before. We're probably not going to be there during. Um, so, you know, it's, I kind of almost see it as there's going to be some third party that comes up and says enough is enough. I'm going to consolidate the information because it's just such a pain point for me. And I want to be able to have someone else be able to really clearly see in one consolidated website, like, here's what United's doing in a quick snapshot. I don't know. That, that's a hypothetical. But um, at this point, just getting the information is really difficult. Um, so it, I, you have to give me the information to make me feel comfortable before I'll even embark on the journey. And then that I think is where we are um, as a society right now. Some people are risk takers, but I think a good portion of our society, the baby boomers, right? They're, if they're risk takers, they probably shouldn't be because <laughs> they are the most at risk. <laughs> um, I, I very much include my parents in that, um, and and we just we just need to get the information out there so that they can make good decisions. Yep, yep. And to that, that's actually really so. My next question, Lance. Um, someone was asking, how many hours prior to one's flight must they arrive at the airport for a domestic trip at this point? From a recommendation perspective, <laughs> you know. Every every cloud has a silver lining, and I guess the silver lining is this: is that we literally have no long wait times at the airport um, right now. We, for social distancing, we have to space people out so the lines may look longer, but there's less people in them. So if you have a domestic flight, you get to the airport an hour before, you should be okay and get in through. That's actually really helpful for me as well. So thank you, Suzanne. I'm going to go back to you. Someone was asking, um, you know, what are travel managers? doing to look at the future of your travel program, whether that's, you know, RFPs or like, is this allowing you the opportunity to kind of rethink the program itself? It is, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, I think it's, it's having us take a pause and see what works in the industry and what doesn't. Um, unfortunately, I'm only available to do anything based on what technology is out there. Um, so, for example, my direct booking strategy wouldn't work without Traxo, right? And and I, so I I hope that this will encourage innovation. This I've been calling it the pause at work. Um, the pause will cause innovation, and then we'll be able to move things forward. So, in terms of RFP, in terms of sourcing new hotels or anything like that, um, we're we're going to focus on cleanliness. We're going to focus on data the way we always have. Um, but you know. I'm, I would love to have a big industry disruptor come come through. That would be amazing. This is an interesting question for Michael. Um, so with uh, sort of, we're seeing more of this like local and regional travel, right? The 200 mile um, kind of number. Is this an opportunity for Marriott to maybe look into smaller properties and I don't know, necessarily compete with like go head to head with like a sh short term rental, but like, is there a space for Marriott to maybe play in there in the future? Well, Marriott does have their homes and villas program. That's right. That's right. Uh, so we, we we do have a toe in that water, uh, and you know, of course, we have. Uh, I think we've got 30 brands at this stage, from you know Ritz Carlton's at the at the most expensive end, and all the way down to uh, you know the Fairfield Inns and the Moxie hotels. Uh, and you know, at this stage, we've got so many different types of properties around the U.S. and around the globe. Uh, I'd like to think we've got um, you know, we've got offerings for all kinds of different different travelers, uh, but you know more more is better. <laughs> yeah, and I completely forgot about the uh, you know, the villa the uh, I forget I already forgot I'm sorry. Um, there are homes and villas. Homes and villas, yes. So I'll definitely have to check that out. You again. can cash your bonvoy points in there. I know. <laughs> um, we're at four minutes left, so I'll just um, kind of this last question I might actually take <laughs> to get a little arc in here. 
Um, so there's a question about if the pandemic is going to lead to greater disintermediation, establishing kind of direct lines between travelers and travel suppliers and bypassing um, sort of those traditional um, intermediaries. And so ARC's view here is that there's a yes and, right? So we talk about omnichannel. And when we talk about omnichannel, what we mean is every channel. So we want to create a future where travelers have the ability um, to book in their preferred method, but also the way to service in in their preferred method. And that's, you know, particularly, you know, Suzanne, I'll let you weigh in here, being important in the corporate space where, you know, being able to capture that booking and then having the TMC be able to see it and know it and be able to support it, you know, that's really where we want to to go, where it, you know, if you book through a TMC, similarly, the, the airline should be able to, to help you if, if you need that help at the time, right? Um, so, Suzanne, I know this is kind of the, the, the crux of your vision. Yeah, absolutely. So, I've, I've always said no one sells United tickets better than United. No one will sell Marriott hotel rooms better than Marriott. Um, and we have people who constantly bring their leisure expectations into corporate travel, and we just don't do a good job selling tickets and rooms um, the way you do in your leisure life. And so to have that blend, um, I think it's really important because there, there, if you've hired somebody, you've hired them for a reason, you should trust them to make good choices without great mandates and policy. That's my mine and my company's opinion, I will say that. Um, and, and so bypassing the GDS, I, there are some people who love the traditional model. I think that there's a place for that, but there are people who don't like the traditional model and there's a place for that too. And, and it's just starting to be, I think, more widely accepted. And to your point, they should be able to co-mingle way, way more than they currently do. Yeah, and again, that's where um, when we say omni-channel, we mean every channel. It's not about disintermediation because are truly <laughs> is a part of that process. So great. I guess I think we're going to end it here. Um, I have a couple of final notes that I'd like to highlight for our for our viewers. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to you three. I really appreciated your time, and I thought this was a fantastic conversation. Um, and I honestly wish we could have just kept going for another hour. Um, I would rather do that than the work I have to do. Um, and also, thank you to everyone who tuned in today and submitted these great questions. Um, we're going we're gonna to come back in September with a recorded set of conversations um, looking into how travel brands can protect their businesses, secure their data, mitigate fraud, um, and really kind of uh, better navigate today's pet landscape. And it's going to be a complement to our annual ARC Fraud Month, which, we'll, um, which we will be releasing information about very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, and lastly, again, I just encourage you to engage with us on your favorite social media channel um, using the hashtag TravelConnect2020. Uh, we recorded this presentation and it will be available very soon. And we'd love it if you could share with your colleagues and your fellow travel industry professionals. Um, as always, you can find all of this on arctravelconnect.com. Um, and then on arccorp.com, you can, um, as I said, find our uh, weekly statistics, our monthly statistics, and some other data. So thank you again so much. Um, be safe, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next time.